if there's a word to give right now to, to church leaders, it's get back to the basics because that's where it broke. Yep. Wow. Hey, thanks for checking out this video from our network. The Canadian Church Leaders Network exists to seed a hopeful future for the church in Canada. We want to come alongside pastors in Canada to serve, equip, and resource them as they in turn do the same for their communities. If you're looking to be further resourced or to connect with more church leaders across our nation who are seeking to learn and lead together, we encourage you to find us on Instagram by searching CCLN or just hit subscribe below. Thanks again for watching this video. We hope it's helpful and encouraging for you. First, I want to, I want to say thanks. Uh, my wife and I just finished reading your latest book on marriage, the Second Happy, and we really appreciated that. And we led hundreds of couples through our church through that, and man, we were so much better for it. And so first, thanks for writing that book. And let me ask you, you know, what was it that made you feel the real need to, to dive into that topic of bettering marriages? You know, good timing. Right? Yeah. You would think uh, if people are not familiar, Brent, with how uh, the cycle of books and printing work, we settled this decision two years ago. Then you have to submit the manuscript a year before it's published, which was prior to COVID taking over. Literally, we submitted the manuscript uh, when COVID hit. Then the book came out. Uh, in February here recently, and the timing seemed uh, ordained, perhaps. Yeah, I think someone had a plan. Yeah, and the point is, and we all get this, when Marsha and I got married, I think it's true for most everyone, if it's not, you know, then you go write a book, <laughs> uh, that you're happy when you get married, like you fall in love, it's awesome, the honeymoon, everything goes with it, and you have high expectations, and then eventually, you begin to see what's wrong, what's broke, the flaws, you're disappointed, marriage doesn't play out like you thought, and you lose that happy. Yep. And I think a lot of people, Brent, settle for unhappy. Mm -hmm. They escape through their work, they cover over it with family and kids, and that's why somewhere along the line, uh, they never quite figure out how to rebuild the second happy. How do you go back and get the happy you once had? We apply it to selling a house. You know, we buy a house, eventually you fall in love with it, but eventually you feel its flaws. Right. And we just put it up for sale, go get another one. Yep. Well, when you do that in marriage and family, it is so destructive to your own soul and your own future. Mm -hmm. You carry all the baggage with you. Why not do it, man? Many are people doing with their homes, renovate. You yeah. can renovate your marriage, find that second happy. Mm -hmm. And so we deal with seven practices, really practical, yep. uh, that'll make your marriage better than your honeymoon, as we say. Yeah, and um, it really did pop the hood for a lot of people to really get in there and begin to deal with the primary functions of a healthy marriage. And we had so much feedback from our church on that. And again, just couldn't recommend the second happy enough. It really, uh, it was, it was very practical, but also like personal. It really did push people to go in, in a level, a level of intentionality with their marriage that a lot of people hadn't done yet. You know, even in areas of prayer, you know, dealing with baggage, just, just, there were so many ways. I think people, it gave them an avenue to, to really start into working on things. And I, I we got a ton of feedback from people just saying this really helped. And so Thank you. Well, that's encouraging to hear. That's yeah. why we do it. Yeah, so, I know. I know. Please. You don't always get that. You don't always get that feedback. And so, you know, you need to know it really did. It really did move the dial for a lot of people here in our context. So um, that said, let's let's dive into this. You know, I've been thinking a lot lately, uh, you know, saying things to myself such as I almost feel like I'm Charles Dickens in my own mind saying, you know, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. It's a season of light and a season of dark, and it's one of these really strange moments in history, and I think pastoral and church leaders are feeling it really head on. Um, and with, so with no prep at all and no indication of where we're going in this conversation, um, I want to throw just a small concept, a small question at you to start. Sure, when you, when I can you, feel it yeah, small. <laughs> when you think about the times that we're living in, you know, as a believer, as a church leader, and you think about, you know, 
there's certainly darkness. There's certainly all kinds of challenge we could talk about culturally, economically, the pandemic, all those things. But what has you like when you zoom out with eyes of faith and you think with the best of times, like what has you optimistic right now about the times that you're leading in, the times we're walking through right now? If God in his sovereign wisdom planted us here for such a time as this, like what has you more optimistic than beat up today? Actually, that's that's a really fair question. And let's, let me go right to your question. Let's, you can come back to it, but let's sure. temporarily skip all the bad and ugly. Yep. Let's set aside the dark and just acknowledge it exists. Now, it might be valuable. Mm-hmm. You, you might want to come back and unpack that because leaders are leading blind right now. And it's a very complex season mm-hmm. to lead. Mm-hmm. And what you don't want is an optimism that is founded on your fears mm. as a cover to get people to restore what you've lost as a leader. That's a really dangerous thing in leadership. So I'm going to say it again, because that's hard to absorb. If you have an optimism that you are just feeding, sending out there, that is really just a cover for your fears in order to get people to practically join you in your false optimism, Mm -hmm as a way to recover what you've lost. That optimism is not solid enough to lead forward. Right. So that said, I'll answer your question. Mm -hmm. My optimism is rooted in who God is and how God has consistently worked. So my optimism, when you say, do you have some? I absolutely do. But it's founded on there has never been a revival without a decline. Right. And the revival seems to be equal in measure to the decline. So it seems like we are in as dark a time as I have ever pastored. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt, I would say that. And you've been pastoring since? So we're we're at 38 years. Yep. And I have never led through a darker, more confusing, more conflicting time where I have uh, the greatest amount of responsibility to lead and the least amount of clarity in how to go forward. Yep. And while I'm doing that, I'm trying to cover up my own insecurities, my own uncertainties, Mm -hmm. my own uh, self-protection. Like, I got to survive this. I got to take a family through this. What's happening to the thing I've spent all these years building? And it's not my thing. But when when you start losing, it starts to become your thing. So optimistically speaking, I have read uh, more biographies of of men and women that God has used over time. I've been sitting in Scripture and it seems consistent, Brent, and it's obvious, and maybe the hearers are going to say, yeah, I know that. But mm-hmm. maybe for a moment, the Holy Spirit would leverage this conversation. Yeah. There is never a miracle without suffering. Mm-hmm. There, there's never a moment where God calms the storm without a storm. So you don't get the Peter walking on water without Peter sinking. You don't get the calming the storm without the storm that terrifies them. And it wasn't fake terror. It was real terror. Mm -hmm. You don't get the story of the, the uh, Red Sea party without Israel being in euphoria leaving, but being in utter terror and hopelessness at the edge of the sea. So Egypt, uh, Egypt's army is coming after them. They have nowhere to go. It is dark, man. It is dark. Well, now we have this amazing story of God's faithfulness. Well, we tend to soak in the miracle, but the people were sitting in the fear and the loss. Right. And when you're in the middle of fear and loss, when you're in the middle of darkness and backwards, when you're in setbacks and unclear future, you have got to reabsorb yourself in the size and the nature of God. 
that is the only source of optimism. So that's my optimism. It looks as dark as ever. I'm praying for and hoping for a revival. Yep. I'm praying and hoping for a move of God. I'm hoping to see God do miraculous things that I've never seen him do before. That's my optimism. It, it seems like it's lining up like that, doesn't it? And I remember uh, a little over a year ago, us praying before this pandemic even happened. Like, again, my heart stirs for revival. And I know that's you've you've stoked that in my life even. Um, yeah. And being a student of revival, I've learned that, you know, exactly what you said, there's this correlation between crisis and what God does on the other side of it. And I was praying for revival, hoping we could skip the crisis part. Um, but it, it, it didn't, it hasn't seemed to work out that way, but I wonder yeah, how's that working out? <laughs> hey, the crisis is here, but I guess that's where we can kind of gain some optimism though. Is like, Hey, where there's an ebb, we know there's going to be a flow and where there's a drought, we know the rain's going to come. And I wonder if, you know, if we were to take the, you know, another analogy when you're, you're talking about several old Testament ones, one of the ones I think about is, um, where, uh, Elijah, you know, I, I hear the sound of heavy rain, he says, you know, yeah. and I see that I see the cloud the size of a hands a man's hand, you know, it's just eyes of faith to see where I think, you know, the the relief or the rain's gonna come from. If you were to look at the times right now and to start like what are you looking at? Like to you, what is the drought? And like, where are those areas right now that like are the are the fronts of the storm front? Maybe the mixed metaphors, and then where is the area of you're you're looking that that same correlating tension point? Whether it's cancel culture or whether it's you know nationalism or division or all those things, like where are you looking? You're saying, oh, that looks like a place that the Lord's kingdom is going to come crashing in. And I'm, I've got eyes to see it. Does that make sense? Like where, you know, what, what are you picking up on in the wind? I guess if that makes sense. Well, why don't, why don't you guide this and see if I'm, see if I'm following you. Uh, because when you say, when you, when you look into culture, then what you're seeing is where it's uh, tending to crash. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Where the culture is falling in on itself, where people are making decisions intending to help them rise up in many ways, either against God unknowingly mm -hmm. or against others. And while they're doing it, they end up losing themselves. It, it, it's not producing the results they had hoped. Cancel culture eventually cancels you. That's right. That, that's yeah. the problem with cancel culture. So at first you're identifying with your, your peeps, your, mm -hmm. the people who are in your little echo chamber, the people who see the world like you see the world. And, and together you decide we're gonna cancel culture the people who don't think like us. Okay. Eventually the values that you put in play mm -hmm. empower a whole world to cancel you. And you're like, no, 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 I don't mean me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, Kay well, Caitlyn Jenner is being canceled now. Right. Yeah, like right? if that doesn't say at all, like if Caitlyn Jenner can't speak to sports and transgender issues, nobody can. So anyway. And and it's crazy yeah. because his uh, life decisions and value choices to many people have a strong lean left, mm -hmm. but his political uh, policies would have a strong lean right. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> the person you say has a right to cancel culture. Now that culture wants to cancel yep. him, her, Wh all. what are we doing, Brent? Yeah. And so that's where the world is going to crash in on itself. In other words, you're the army that pushed Israel to the Red Sea. God parts the sea. They go through on dry ground. You're going to go through on dry ground and it comes in on you. You helped create the crisis mm. that drowns you. Yep. And we are living in a world that has helped create the crisis that is drowning them. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it is a rough, now I'm not sure they can see mm -hmm. or that they would agree that God's anywhere in that. I, I agree that takes eyes of faith, but we're having this conversation of people yep. of faith who believe everything starts with God. We have an involvement in it and we can help crash things. Yeah. And that stuff is falling apart. Yeah, it is. I, I think I, I, it makes me really hopeful though, when it comes down to it, like for people to see, you know, what a time where truth is at a premium, you know, like actual authoritative truth, spiritual authority. Like, I mean, people are looking for the kingdom without the King and we need, we need the kingdom to crash in. And it's, uh, I, I think it's happening. I really do. You know, when you think about 
revival, you think about that coming, you know, one of the things I think about is revival is something that happens to the church before it comes through the church. And it's something that God needs to do in the heart of his people. You know, you mentioned even some of the things that have been lost. You know, what, how do you think God is reshaping the church right now? This is a big question. Um, you know, what, what are some of the things just objectively, even you're saying like, that's something that, you know, an old wineskin that God is removing, or that's some house cleaning that he's doing here. Where are you seeing the, the hand of the Lord shaping the church right now? Well, I, I think Brent, and this will be a longer answer. So just feel free to I'm here for interrupt because this is a, this is a real conversation. I was in circles, uh, with pastors who were leading what might be considered some larger churches and people of leadership influence uh, in those circles. And there was a lot of optimism that as things began to shut down with the pandemic, that this was going to be the path when the church rose up Mm -hmm. and demonstrated that we know the king, we have the power of the living God in us in a world where things are going to be compressed and things are going to be lost, like in the States unto 9-11 or moments like that, Mm -hmm. or war, Mm -hmm. when a nation goes to war with another nation, uh, you have an enemy and that creates a a uniting and a knitting. Mm -hmm. And so there were several conversations I, I was in where we tended to believe among those circles that there was going to be a knitting, a pushing together, a uniting, Uh, And that that was going to be momentous for the church and the world would be listening more like they would at, at, in the States, a nine 11 season. Mm -hmm. And it has done the opposite. Yep. It, It has, it has taken, it has taken a people who had a, I'm going to call it this, a consumer convenient faith. And it has become inconvenient and costly and it push it's pushing us down to our roots and if you don't have deep roots if it isn't truly founded on surrender to christ then church is no longer convenient it's more costly it's not well designed for consumers and if in that process brent you lose the voice of the church. And so now I'm just going to give an opinion. Mm -hmm. I think what happened is the church was able through worship together, gathering weekly, small groups, serving together, serving out the community. So things like worship, community, and impact. Those are the words we would tend to use in our little church circle. When those things got frozen, lost, removed, Mm -hmm the voice of the culture and media became louder. Yep. And the ch- I lost my voice to my congregation. I now only had a voice at their convenience. If they didn't want to listen anymore, they wouldn't get up in the middle of a service and walk away. Right. But right now they can just hit a button, I'm done. I'll listen to that. And, and what, what happened then is we don't know this, but we listen at our convenience until we're only listening to the people who share our same politics. Mm -hmm. And if you all have to have the same identical politics, I'm not talking about moral values. Mm -hmm. I'm talking political bents and preferences and not in the nuance of biblical clarity, but I mean up in the political arena where there's a lot of arguments where you can move right and left and you didn't change the word of God. Mm -hmm. When somebody has to share all of your same particular politics or they can't possibly be in the body of Christ, you start leading out of your politics getting hardened in your own own categories, gathered in your own echo chambers, pushed against by nobody else to make you love one another like we have to love in the church until you become convinced that you and the 10% that think like you have Jesus on your side. Right. And politics becomes your religion, and you add Christ to it. And I think we are in a crisis of Christian clarity And so now I'm going to say it like this. Mm -hmm. What has happened in the last year 
is that our world has retained the same vocabulary, but changed the dictionary, and we can't have conversations anymore. We just don't know what anybody means anymore. Right. I don't know what it means when you say Jesus. I don't know when, what, what it means when you say you're a follower of Christ. I don't know what it means when you say church. Frankly, I don't know what you mean when you say marriage. I don't know what you mean when you say gender. I don't know what you mean when you say equality or equity. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean when you say words that used to have the same dictionary meaning so we could at least use the same vocabulary. Yep. The dictionary has changed in COVID. And everybody keeps using the same vocabulary. We're talking over each other, around each other, at each other, but not with each other. Yeah. It is a mess. Well, an how, absolute mess. How, so how have you, I think you're, you're nailing exactly, especially for church leaders who are listening. A lot of the, the, the arena or the, like the common ground that we used to have to minister, whether it's language whether it's weekly connection, whether it's even pastoral authoritative structures. Like I had an individual come in my office not too long ago, literally say, sit down and say, I want you to listen. I'm not here for your opinion. And, and basically this, and then said something about like, this is a democracy and you have to listen to me. It basically said, and I was like, okay, we don't have the same understanding of how this works, but go on. But like, so a lot of that common ground is just has shifted and it's, it's left a lot of us as pastors swim into like what do we take hold of right now you know and i think i'm picking up even in what you were saying there i do and i've been sensing this this you know one of the things we're doing right now is just clarifying what do we mean by these things yes. and we're having very basic like very basic creedal christian conversations but like how have you i mean you're not immune to this you're in this arena too and you've got four decades now of experience that isn't super helpful at some level. And you're like trying to figure out this new arena to navigate. What, where are you getting traction? <laughs> Help us. Uh, I'm not sure if I should attempt to be in the dialogue or if I should just join in the commiseration. Both. We both. could spend the whole time and commiserate. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure it's helpful, but I'm not sure it doesn't help just a little bit because empathy goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I think a lot of leaders wonder if somebody else has a silver bullet to solve this and they just don't, mm -hmm. they're left uh, blind. And, and so let me be really candid off the top. Uh, boy, this is going to, I don't know that I want to say this. <laughs> this is going to be, this is going to be Canada anyway. So don't, don't worry about it. This is... uh, leaders cannot take all their vulnerability to their followers or you, you come across with a weakness that forfeits your ability to lead. I get that. Mm -hmm. But if we don't have a humility and a certain vulnerability in our authenticity, I don't think we're going to be able to lead there as well. So in truth, this has been the most hostile season of pastoral leadership I have ever experienced bar none. There is no second. Mm -hmm. I don't have what's a close second. It, it is unbelievably beyond my imagination. And this includes people we have led to Christ and discipled for years. Mm -hmm. And the hostilities in our nation, driven through political values, interpreted as the biblical meaning, right. without actually starting with the Bible, has left me in a position where I can hardly speak on anything with clarity, meaning this, it takes three times longer to say something. Mm -hmm. And everybody feels equal to me in the conversation or greater because we've yeah. spent a generation in social media where every voice is equal and everybody should have an opinion. And that has now moved to Christian biblical church authority. Yep. 
Well, when you remove all that, it's kind of like saying there are no parents in the world. Mm -hmm. We are all parents or we're all children, yep. but we're all equal. That's what equal means. Yep. Now, what's interesting to me is that is not true for people when it comes to the doctor. Yeah. Because I've asked people, are all voices equal? Yes. Is that true for picking a restaurant? Yes. Is that true for going to the doctor? Oh, no, 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 no. See, they, they, they won't go to the neighbor next I because it's cheaper. You can get somebody to do surgery on you for like 500 bucks yeah. instead of a half a million. Yeah. No, no, no. I need an expert. So, so let's not be confused. We immediately know that it's foolish. As soon as you get to doctors, health, really, who you, who are you going to invest your money? The guy who's bankrupted himself or the guy who's made a billion, yeah, right? Yeah. It's creeping so, in there though, too. I think like if you talk to some doctors, like I, I have a surgeon friend, it's like, I mean, the web MD, you know, like age that we live in, you know, he's, he was saying the other day, like, I usually have to listen to the first 10 minutes of self diagnostics before it's like, okay, do you want to hear what I think? <laughs> you know, that, so. that is so helpful. I, I have to practice out my own doctor. I have pulled off from most web MD research because I've watched people do the same thing. Yep. And then, so literally I'll ask my doctor a question. I'll say, now I read this. Tell me what you think instead of telling him what I read just enough. Yep. So to bring it into, into our arena, What's interesting is you mentioned the creed. I have pastored for 38 years. I've senior pastored for over 30 of those, which means primary communicator. I don't know. I started teaching 42 to 45 weekends a year, consistently every week, plus other times. Mm -hmm. I have never taught the apostles creed or the Nicene creed. Mm -hmm. We are in the midst of teaching every weekend down through the Nicene creed. Yep. yep. Precisely because of what we're saying. So here's the principle it works in leadership. It works everywhere. It's always true. When people lose their way, you have to go back to the basics, right? When tiger woods was not, advancing his game back in the day, what would he do? He would go back to his golf swing, get another golf coach and refine the swing, the swing, the swing, because your game, your score is no better than your swing. And what happens is that a professional golfer or any professional athlete over time, their confidence in their swing or their skill gets sloppy in the basics with success comes sloppy almost always. Mm -hmm. So under pressure, when things are disintegrating, crashing, falling apart, stumbling, or you're not winning like you once did in business, in sports, I think in ministry, you have to drill back down to the basics because usually those are what's gotten lost. And what we're seeing during COVID is that people were weak in the basics and under pressure That's right. could not see that they were buying into hip, into a heretical thinking, into unbiblical practices. They're remaking the church in their own image. In America, it would be people don't actually know the Constitution so that when somebody rewrites it, it makes sense to them. They think, well, yeah, let's do that. When it's illegal, it's like it's, it's impossible. I think that's true in the church. If there's a word to give right now to, to church leaders, it's get back to the basics because that's where it broke. Yeah. Wow. That's that's and, I, and that's what I've been sensing myself. So it's it's really helpful to hear that that's how you're processing it. And what do you think is going to happen? And I, and I, so let's, let's roll that out. So you're preaching through the, the apostles creed. I we've, we have read as a church entirely, like three times, I think in the last six weeks out loud, all together in your homes, in your home church, at our locations, 
We're going to read this. This is the Apostles' Creed. And I'm getting all the emails about, what's, are we a Catholic church? Because it's, it's, it's in the Apostles' Creed, the Holy Catholic right. Church. Like, that's how basic, you know, the, 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 the broken kind of, the broken basics are, I guess, to say it. To say yes. it. But, um, you know, we've been, we've been doing that. So kind of that, go back to the basics, let's instill the truth. What do you think is going to happen as we walk this out over the next 12, 18, 24 months of, hey, as you know, we're doing a time right now. We're saying, as for me and my house, these are the paramount non-negotiables. Yep. This is what we believe. Yep. Take it or leave it. Get in or get out. What do you think is going to happen? How is this going to flesh itself out in the typical Western church context? Well, at, um, every certainty that I will be wrong, I will answer your question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for sure. You'll be partially right. I, I have every confidence I will be wrong. Uh, but I will tell you what I think. Right now, we are experiencing a whole crowd of people who used to stand for Christ. I'm going to say used to stand for Christ or used to stand with their particular local church who over COVID either do not have the basics and so they are confused or deceived and they're interpreting life through politics. I'm going to get another group or have become so convenience driven that they are unaware and deceived that they have an independent Christianity, which was never a biblical offer. Never. They, so by virtue of that, it means you don't understand the basics mm -hmm. have become more consumer oriented and are comfortable with half of what's going on in the world. And they're going to ride it out with a, I believe, but without fully practicing it. So I'm going to say all of those three, I just illustrated those people once stood and now they're taking a seat and the people that are going to remain standing are the ones who stand with the basics. You can call it a remnant. You can call it rebuilding, which I think it is, mm -hmm. or you could call it reinforcing whatever it is doing. There is a group of people who are going to say, well, I'm not going to sit. Yeah. I'm standing. Mm -hmm. And my job right now is to help the people who are called committed to stand to keep standing to help the people who have taken a seat, so to speak, and they're not aware of they're confused or heretical or to help them stand back up mm -hmm. if they want to. Yeah. And to help the people who have never stood for Christ and don't understand what's going on, but they can see the foolishness of the world and what's crashing around them. And they might be captivated. Mm -hmm. Well then consider Christ and come stand for him. Yeah. Okay. That's what I'm doing. You say, so what's going to happen? I think the group that is standing will stand stronger than ever. I think there are people who will sit down and are sitting down for us. It's in the thousands. Mm -hmm. So maybe our influence just go our influence over a month might be in the, a few tens of thousands that we might have reached. Well, 10,000 of those have sat down, mm -hmm. maybe more. I don't know. Give or take. Yeah. But when they sit down, what they don't know is what they've lost. And over the next year, the cost on their life will begin to weigh. Mm -hmm. The emptiness will increase. They'll start seeing the foolishness. They'll start feeling the drought. They'll start feeling the um, absence of the power and the presence of God and its loss prevailing in their marriage or their kids or their job. Like, like as things are going to come back to normal, but they're going to be more empty. And mm -hmm. I think there will be a movement that's revival. Yes. I think the unbelieving will have a un, uh, let's see, what's it? A quiet ear toward the church and Christ to find out, is that more an answer than I know? Hmm. Because what's going to come in the wake of the decisions being made 
will be more and more loss. We, good decisions, moral, founded, val, high value decisions are not being made right now yep. across the whole Northern American mm -hmm. territory. And you're up in that North America. It, we're, you can't help but lose. So you pick up the story of Elijah. Listen, there was no point in praying for a cloud unless there was a drought. And the drought went long enough until everybody felt it. Right. That's a good word. It, some of us feel it faster than others because we can see. Mm -hmm. We can see where it's going. But it takes time until everybody feels it. And everybody can't see it. And everybody doesn't feel it. We're printing money and handing it out. We're, we're, we're putting Band-Aids on serious wounds. Mm -hmm. we're, we're hoping to cover over foolish decisions as a, as a nation, in my opinion. Yeah. And the church, to be honest, it's not like the whole church, everybody who calls himself church, is making great value decisions. Mm -hmm. There is heretical, biblically conflicting views being called Christian in our nation at a level unprecedented. So the church is going to end up having to battle itself. Yeah. And that's happening. So Brent, I think that over the next couple of years, if the church does a really good job rebuilding the foundations, it gets to have a shot at rebuilding above the foundation. Yep. And I think we're trying to figure out how to capture what we've lost above the foundation. And I'm concluding and conceding I cannot. I've taken the losses. Yep. So I'm not going to recapture what's above the foundation. Gains and losses, I've taken them. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to rebuild the foundation because I have to rebuild. So let's, let's for the last little, little few minutes we have, let's, let's play this Elijah story out. Um, so it tells us that like Elijah goes to Mount Carmel, has the big showdown with the prophets of Baal, confronts the ideologies of the day that are, are making the bad decisions. It actually says he, re, he rebuilt the altars that have been broken. And then he puts the sacrifice on that, calls down fire. We know how it goes. And then the nation sees and then it says like, and they, they returned, they repented. And they said, you know, the Lord, he is God. Then we know though, you flip the, flip the next page, Elijah burns out. Like he yeah. hits, he goes, you know, depression. Right, yeah. And I mean, there's been a lot of pastors already running down that road and the, the, the revival fire hasn't even hit yet. But I mean, there are more people. I mean, I read just this morning, I think it was something like 29% of pastors over this past year have really strongly considered quitting, uh, leaving it behind. Um, I've, had, I've even had those, those thoughts like, hey, maybe now's a good time to switch careers, you know, and like those, those weird daydream kind of things. And I have had to process through why did I get in this in the first place? You know, those, the, again, back to the foundations like of my calling. You know, let me, let me ask you the question, and you've been helpful for me in this in the past even, you know, and this is probably the best time to ask you because if you ever had a chance to like break glass and just be like, you know what, this is going to be a mess. I'm going to leave it to, you know, Brent Ingersoll's generation to pick up this one. Like if you ever wanted to pull off the exit, you, you know, life, stage of life right now, you probably could. And yet you are doubling down on, hey, I am called to this. Uh, I'm not released. How how are you keeping your calling fresh in this to kind of gear up for what's ahead? And what would you say to pastors who are struggling? Let's go right to that. I'm going to stay in your Elijah story. We're misdiagnosing the story in timing. We're in the story where he is hungry and God needs to feed him. The drought is present. You're on your own and you're fatigued. And you need to know how to have the Holy Spirit feed you or you can't go on. We are not in the depression, the story post revival. We're in the aloneness hmm. of fatigue where you need to learn how to be fed by God. That's where we are right now, Brent, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. 
And so if I may be so bold, what pastors are discovering is they might be as weak in the basics as their people. Here's what, what I mean. My son's a golfer and he loved to follow Tiger Woods. He's 26. So this was back in high, middle school, high school. And here's what he discovered. He's happy with an 80 and Tiger Woods is not. Let me apply it to pastors. Your congregation has to have a deep foundation in the basics. But if you're going to pastor, you better have a deeper well than your people. You better be drawing from deep places. You better know how to wait before the Lord and be fed so that when you walk out of your prayer closet, you have the power of God and your soul centered. And the soul of a pastor is being unsettled as much as it is for the people. Not because we have the same score, but because we have to have a better score. We have to be deeper. We have to be more in intimate. We, you need to spend more time in your soul so that you are centered so that what's happening in the world does not undo you. Mm. Then, then you'll have the power of God on you to get to the place where you can walk up to Mount Carmel and you can experience the power of God. You can speak to a cancel culture. You can speak to a culture who has gone away from God and you can have the authority of God upon you. Then we'll deal with the depression that comes from revival and it comes to everyone mm -hmm. after revival. But I don't think we've seen revival. Right. No, I think pastors are figuring out that they don't know how to be fed by the spirit of God. Yeah. I, I think, and totally I think right. it's demanding we go deeper. I, I, that's just that's an incredible way of saying like I, I felt coming into this year the the Lord kind of really drew back the curtain on my own life and how much of my my intimacy with him was really run on adrenaline and being in front of people and making big decisions and just the momentum of being in spiritual atmospheres and once that went away like the last year was like I I am not as deep with him as I thought and having to, you know, to, to walk that out and to, to deal with the reality, the reality that's, that's in there. But the beautiful thing that happened, you know, early, I'd say January, it was just like this re-surrendering of God. There's not as much of me as I thought there was, but what there is, you can have. And that kind of re, re-upping. And I think, I think that's the groundwork that needs to happen uh, again in so many people, you know, what advice would you give, I guess, to the person who's right now, you know, in the throes of this, maybe coming to that realization, what, like, what is that dialogue with God? How do you point them in that direction? Like what's God wanting to do in them or get from them, I guess, for lack of a better word. I, uh, God formed a phrase in me, Brent, that, that redefined me. And this was, 20 years ago, lead like a man, pray like a boy. Now you can apply that as a female leader and put it in your own context. What, but what it really means is this, don't come to God as a person who has it all together. Bring all your fears, all your uncertainty. I, I don't want anybody to know how many times I quit pastoring in the last 12 to 14 months it would be embarrassing, but it was several. I wouldn't want anybody to know how many times I've reconstructed life in case God doesn't rebuild. Mm. What if I'm stuck? Yeah. I have surrendered to him multiple times and then taken it back because this has gone on too long. I'm as disappointed at some places as disappointed in myself as I am anybody else. Mm -hmm. yep. I, our congregation on the whole, all the way around, we have some wonderful people still do, of course, but, but I could say I'm disappointed in people and I am, mm -hmm. but I'm equally disappointed in myself. Yep. And I am surprised after all these years, Brent, that you can't live off from last month's move of God. 
I can't borrow from last week's devotions. Yeah. My prayer and obedient has to be as current as today. That requires me to take all that I am to all of who God is and wait before him. I was reading in Psalm 106 today, and it was talking about how Israel would not wait for the plan of God to unfold. Hmm. Meaning they would not trust him in continued surrender, faithfulness, and dependence, allowing the timing of his plan to unfold. As I read that, I thought, wow, I can indict people for that, but that's me too. I, Brent, I don't, I don't know his full plan, and I don't know his timing, mm-hmm. and I hate waiting. Yep. And this requires me, over COVID, to reconstruct how I wait before the Lord, how he feeds me, how I get centered in him, and regardless the speed at which he rebuilds the church or lets us recover and reach people, I am called to be faithful. I'm called to pastor. I'm called to spiritually lead. Mm-hmm. Where, if you're listening, wherever he has called you, it is unlikely he uncalled you in crisis. Most unlikely. So I learned from leaders ahead of me years ago, never make a life-altering decision under crisis. Go back to the basics and walk in them until you can be in crisis and remain consistent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's huge. It's unbelievably huge. I, I, final kind of question along those lines then is, you know, what? how are you managing your ability to wait? Because so much of the value of a leader especially is your your go, right? It's the, yeah. we have, I'm the one with vision, I'm the one with the ideas. Like I have this constant angst of I've got to get, I've got to get stuff out there to people, you know, I've, we've created this infrastructure of vision and implication and execution and all that. And it's like, now we're in this hurry up and wait phase, you know, how, how are you posturing yourself and how are you inviting the church into that in a way that's, that's healthy? We decided early on and sort of went public with this, that we think that people will be, some will be green light, some will be yellow light, some will be red light, and how they experience COVID. And green light meaning, you know, they'll travel through it. They're like, we, we should just be go, let's stay together as a church, whatever. And But then you got political, and then you have governmental, and then you, so you might be green inside, but the culture won't let you. And there's some people would be yellow, and some people red, and then on different issues, mask, no mask, and how you handle it. And now it's vaccine, no vaccine. And now it's, should we be there, or should we not? You have limits in Canada. So so here's here's what I had to settle in me. We have more horsepower than we can use. We have more ideas than we can implement, but I can't move faster than the speed of the world around me. Hmm. So therefore, I better make sure that I am not just red or green. Here's what I mean. There are several areas where you are shut off, it's red, and you can do nothing. Do not embrace that as everything and do nothing. Figure out where can I push, where can I advance, what can I do? In other words, it's so simple. Focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. Mm -hmm. If you get in too many conversations of what you can't do, Brent, you will get stuck in your own stuckness. So while it's all true, we shifted our conversations a few months ago and said, what can we do? Who can we reach? How can we reach them? What can we do? What could be the new innovation? We'll probably be wrong in a year, but we could do it right now. Mm -hmm. Where is the kingdom innovation right now that doesn't present itself, but it took this problem to come up with it? Mm -hmm. What would God leverage right now? Okay, who can I reach? I know who I can't reach. Who can I reach? I know we can't gather. Okay, for gathering, only uh, only 33% were coming back, and we're opening. Oh, but these won't. Okay, well, who can we reach? What can we build in them? 
What can you do, not what can't you do? It is on the shoulders of leaders to spend the majority of their time and energy on what can you do, not what you can't. Mm -hmm. It's huge. And put 100% of your energy in what you can do. Unless you will be further than anyone else if you spend the majority of your time on what you can do and put 100% of your energy in what you can do. It's huge. It's too simplistic, but I think it makes a point. It, it is, and we need to hear it. I mean, it's it's such a, because I've, I mean, I know every leader out there listening probably has felt that I keep throwing my shoulder into this door and it is not opening. Like, it just, it's a cement wall and it's not moving. So Right. It's, so could it be that it's, it's, this sounds so silly, but you said that, so I'll say it. But could it be that you just have to cut that door into 15 doors and open them one at a time Hmm. and you never open the door you just cut through it and so you get a little three by three square well that's light that's opening that you can reach through i know it sounds hokey Mm -hmm. i know it sounds cheesy i know but if a leader doesn't paint a picture of progress nobody can go anywhere Mm -hmm. it is on the shoulders of leaders to yes define reality but equally to define forward Mm -hmm. Huge. And if forward is only one step, that's one step further than where you were. I don't care if it's three steps forward, two back. It's still one step further. Mm. And I feel like that's what I'm leading. I'm leading blind. It's unclear. And I sort of don't know what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. But I am trying to get one more step forward. Huge. Let's let's close with this, PK. Um you know, we know from being students of the word and from students of church history, like the Lord doesn't just prune for the sake of drawing back. He does it to bring more fruitfulness, you know, and we're working on the foundations in this season and it's tedious and painful and heavy lifting, but there will come a time where a new structure gets birthed and built up and God is going to do a new thing. Preach, preach like if you're if you're thinking about you know what's the dream here in another another few years five years ten years and revival hits like what are you dreaming about that's keeping you motivated that we can you know share in some of that hope today. Brent, all all of you listening, if 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 I get this moment, then let me say something. Never assume you dream bigger than God. One of the most dangerous things we do, Brent, is when we can't see, when we can't plan, when we can't strategize, and when it's not clear, when it's cloudy, we go create our own sun. When God already created it and it's on the other side of the clouds. Mm -hmm. When God moves the clouds, you'll see the sun. Everything will warm up. Always does. Let's not start acting like we have to out envision God. You you cannot out envision, out think, out compassion, out love God. God already sent his son. You don't love lost people more than he does. Mm -hmm. Spiritually unresolved people matter more to God than they do you. Jesus is the head of the church. You don't love the church more than he does. Mm -hmm. If he's pruning It's to make it better. It's to forcefully advance the kingdom. He came in the fullness of time. He ministered for 33 years. He voluntarily died on the cross. He rose on the day he intended to rise. Let's quit pretending he has to rise on the second day. He can rise on the third day. So the vision is stay really close to the king of vision, to the God who builds sons that sit on the other side of clouds and know this if it's cloudy where you are it's still sunshine above it so you are not going to get a vision of the next five years or ten years bigger you can't it'll always be under the clouds Mm -hmm. smaller than god's vision so stay so close to him that when the clouds break you can see the sun you can join a bigger vision i'm not gonna solve all this Mm -hmm. I have no vision bigger than his. Mm -hmm. And the church is enormous. And if this all falls apart, I go to heaven. Love it. I'm basically, I'm closer to heaven than you. 
mathematically speaking, you could go ahead of me. Are you kidding me? Nobody is out envisioning, out loving, or out maneuvering God. That's why we have peace. The rest of the world does not. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Could I get you to breathe a prayer for? Let's pray for the church in the West, specifically Come Canada. On. Could you could you breathe a prayer over us today? Love to. So, Heavenly Father, to be your sons and daughters is our only peace. It's what allows your love to be in us, and it's greater than our ability to love people. So pour your love into us. Mm. Your joy sustains us when circumstances are in conflict. So put your joy in us because some of us have lost it. Your peace is unlike the peace of the world. And Jesus, you said, I would give you peace, not like the world gives. So a world can be in conflict, but we can be in peace. Then patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, on and on. God, I'm going to pray that first you would do a fresh work in every leader who would say, right now, Holy Spirit, would you do that in me? Mm. I, I, I'm fearful. I, I'm anxious. I see loss. I'm worried for myself, for my family, for what we've built all these years. I don't know when, when church is going to come back together. I don't know when I get to relead. I don't know how to rebuild. God, would you teach us how, as sons and daughters, mere children, to bring the weight of it all to you? And then would you pour fresh vision into us? Would you remind us that in the darkest of times, your sun shines on the other side of it? A day is coming when the clouds will pass. And if they don't, if worst of worst, it gets uglier, <laughs> and we die, we get to be with you. If it gets uglier before it gets better, but in that, God, it gets darker, preparing for a greater revival and move of your spirit, then give us endurance, yeah. give us long suffering, give us faithfulness. May we see goodness when the world cannot. Give us self-control, the ability to wait until your plan unfolds. Make us so faithful and powerful in that. Mm that as leaders, the world looks around and says, I don't see anybody who can live like they live. And may we be powerful witnesses. Be that powerful in us and then through us, I pray, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, PK. I really appreciate it. Absolute joy. Before you go, we want to let you know about a few things we do here at CCLN that might serve you as you lead yourself and others. Firstly, we regularly release interviews with incredible church leaders from across Canada and the world on our podcast called the Canadian Church Leaders Podcast. So we encourage you to check that out wherever you listen to your podcasts. Secondly, we send out a monthly newsletter with the best resources, podcasts, books, and articles that we've put together for leadership in the Canadian context. If you want it sent straight to your inbox each month, head to ccln.ca to sign up. Lastly, we run a two-year program called the Church Leaders Incubator, created for young pastors to strengthen their character and ministry for long-term, effective senior leadership. If you're leading a church in Canada or on a trajectory to do that one day, we would love you to consider applying this year or the next. You can learn more about it on our website. Well, thanks again for checking this out. We love you all and are cheering you on. Bye for now.